Good morning, and thanks everyone for joining us for Business Transformation with IoT. To minimize confusion and best manage time and respect yours, everyone will be muted during this presentation, though you can still chat and submit questions through the GoToWebinar interface. We will have a Q&A segment at the end of the presentation to answer any questions you may have. If we are unable to get to all of your questions in the time allowed, we'll send a follow-up email because we want to make sure we clear any confusion you may have. As a quick reminder, our goal with this webinar is to help you better understand IoT in general, how IoT initiatives can drive your profit, can, sorry, excuse me, can drive profit for your manufacturing company, and how to select the IoT initiatives that are most likely to make a difference in transforming your business. Now, I'd like to introduce Ectobox's founder and CEO, Kevin Jones. Kevin has over 20 years experience in software working with manufacturing companies and has become an expert in IoT and IoT in the manufacturing industry. Take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. And good morning, or maybe good afternoon to some, but good morning to most probably. Uh, Rachel, let me know if we cannot see the screen. I think it should look okay here. Um, so uh, let's get into the fun of, of IoT. Uh, to start with, oh yeah, I'm already running into a couple technical problems. Okay, that's a little bit better. Uh, to start with, uh, to reiterate what uh, Rachel was saying, we are IoT experts that provide consulting services and product solutions, uh, and our focus is really to improve our client's competitive position through the work that we do uh, as Ectobox. In this session today, what I'd like to do is to talk about how IoT can transform a business, go through some key components of an IoT solution, uh, get in a little bit to how IoT projects work, uh, cover some do's and don'ts, and then leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. We'll start with a brief overview, a very, very brief overview of what IoT is. Uh, we went over this in our first webinar uh, for this month, uh, and if you weren't there for it, uh, hopefully you can catch on quickly for, for what IoT is. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, so uh, you've probably seen the IBM Watson elevator commercial before, and I think that's a really good definition of IoT. Imagine in an office building, very office, or a very busy office building, an elevator repairman walks up to the security desk and says to the security desk, hey, your elevator's broken. The security desk guy looks at him with a really questioning look on his face and says, I, I don't know what you're talking about. The elevators are working fine. Look, everybody's getting on and off. They're, everything's fine. And, uh, of course, the... The conversation continues where the elevator guy ends up pointing to the elevator and say, that system over there is telling me it's going to break in about two days or two weeks, and if I don't fix it, there's going to be a lot of problems. Uh, and that system, that pointing that he's doing over his shoulder, is the IoT software platform. It's the whole IoT solution for those elevators. It's that solution that helps them determine what's going to happen to those machines before it happens such that they know uh, it needs to be fixed or maintained before an issue occurs, which then provides value to uh, the, the the repair service, maybe additional revenue, also provides value to the the building owners and all the occupants uh, where the the elevators will continue running uh, when they when they need to be running. That is IoT. IoT can take data from sensors and provide valuable information like predicting when an issue is going to occur well before it occurs, and then alert the right people about the issue, and then ensure the issue is fixed. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the definition of what IoT is. It's, again, just like I said, it's pulling data from sensors on machines, uh, pieces of equipment, whatever they might be. And again, this is within the context of manufacturing, because that's our focus. We're not talking smart cities, smart homes, farm agriculture, uh, or anything else. This is manufacturing. Uh, even though our example is something that everybody can easily connect with, uh, uh, elevators. But let's say we're pulling data from sensors on the motors that run those elevators. And then we're pulling that data over the Internet. And then we are transforming that data into valuable information. Uh, and then uh, we continue with the definition to say that that valuable information can enable powerful business incomes. And a really interesting point is, we could take it even further, is that those powerful business outcomes can be 
that we can help companies transform their business models to selling products from uh, as a product to selling those products as a service to drive better connections with their clients, better uh, revenue, better margins, keeping the clients happier, and then maybe even someday moving to uh, an outcomes-based uh, business model. Uh, a little bit more detail on uh, IoT. I mean, here are a few ways to, to look at what IoT is. IoT is effectively it's converting physical action and data into digital data. Uh, there's a sensor. That sensor detects a, a certain type of uh, activity on a piece of equipment uh, through a thermocouple or something else. Uh, that activity is then transformed into a digital signal. That digital signal is then sent over the wire to a collection point. And then that's pushed into the IoT software platform. And that data and all the other data values from that piece of equipment and other pieces of equipment are then transformed into useful information in an IoT software platform. And it's in that IoT software platform that the data is then pushed into uh, pushed up to the end users, where it's transformed and, and provided to the end users to drive action and drive decision. The IoT solution allows companies to monitor and manage activities in various areas of the business, such as you know, the condition of the machines, like the elevators. Uh, IoT allows physicians to monitor heartbeats and the respiration of babies in homes, uh, where it can allow the parents to take care of the baby uh, in a warm home environment uh, for the babies to develop where maybe they have, were born prematurely uh, and have some development issue. Uh, IoT can tell you what food is in your refrigerator and automatically order missing items from the grocery store. Uh, we've been hearing about that kind of example for a, a long time. Uh, there are a lot of different situations where IoT can be used to help people and organizations. And one of the most common ways a person will interface with IoT is, is through dashboards, alerts, analysis, reports, receiving certain services, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. But in the end, this is a key takeaway here. In the end, IoT for our conversation is it's simply a collection of technologies which supports business goals for manufacturing companies, our focus, and other industrial companies. It's simply a collection of technologies which supports business goals. That's all it is. Um, a few quick examples, the Cheez-It button uh, from Amazon, uh, lots of different uh, easy buttons, if you will, from Amazon. Press the button, uh, data is sent uh, from that button up to uh, Amazon, and you receive a valuable service in the end, getting a box of Cheez-Its uh, delivered to your house, my favorite kind of IoT service. Um, the iBeacons. Uh, used in retail situations to broadcast information and provide value to, to shoppers and also provide value to the retailers to, to know who's shopping where, uh, what they're doing within the store, etc. Asset tracking, certainly very viable. Maintenance on the bottom left, the guy checking out a machine, well, we, he could probably actually do that remotely and get more information than what he can do uh, using his senses. Um, see uh, what he can see, what he can hear, what he can touch uh, for temperature, et cetera, uh, and what he can smell. Uh, condition monitoring by a service department is another example, too, on the bottom right. Uh, a service department could have a map, get indicators with uh, red, yellow, green uh, on the map to know what's going on with all the products that they've put out into the world. These are all good, quick examples of IoT solutions within the context of, uh, well, some of it within manufacturing. Uh, one of the questions a lot of companies uh, ask themselves is, why should I do IoT? Well, there's a big market for it, but, uh, uh, but better yet for them, there's a big opportunity for business outcomes. Uh, a few stats, 31 by 2020, 31 billion, uh, excuse me, 31 billion connected devices, uh, $11 trillion industry, uh, and this is the really important one for manufacturing. Anywhere between $1.3 to $3.7 trillion of economic impact, specifically in manufacturing. What that means, economic impact, uh, means dollars saved or new dollars earned. Dollars saved through uh, uh, lower costs, lower expenses. Dollars earned through new sources of revenue generated 
for new products developed or new services provided because of the IoT solutions that are in place, for example, for a service department. $3.7 trillion, it's a lot of money. Uh, so there's some really good reasons to, to look at uh, IoT. Uh, one of the other points, too, that I meant to, to mention, there are uh, some people ask themselves, well, why should I embrace IoT? Those numbers are great. They're very large. They seem unrealistic. That's a research company just throwing around some big numbers. But let's let's maybe ask them in return, well, why should you embrace the Internet? Not the Internet of Things, but the original Internet from years ago. Think back to when we didn't have the Internet. Uh, what kinds of things has that enabled? What kind of businesses, full industries, trillion, multi-trillion dollar industries has that uh, allowed to, to be created? And how has that helped our lives, made our lives better? So with that in mind, could you imagine a life without the internet now? Uh, it's not very easy. And the same is going to be true with IoT. So the IoT, and I say that because the IoT is an extension of the internet. You look at the word, internet of things, data pushed over the internet, converted to valuable, inf that data is then converted to valuable information. So IoT is an extension of the internet, and it will be a part of every business. So really, it's not so much a question of why or if, but rather when. So at that point, let's take advantage of it. Again, within the context of uh, business rules, let's, or excuse me, within context of manufacturing, let's take a look at some of the goals that manufacturing companies and other industrial companies try to achieve using IoT. Some of them are to manage costs. Some of them are to uh, uh, decrease or increase uh, productivity, uh, create new sources of revenue. They all have these business goals. Uh, growth, margin, profits, beating out the competition. But in today's market, those goals are increasingly difficult to achieve. To achieve them, companies must continue to be more efficient. Uh, and they have to increase output. They need to work uh, for more demanding customers, work under increasing uh, regulations, which is more and more difficult. Uh, and all the while, they need to continue with their current or better margins and profits. This is where uh, I believe IoT can really add a lot of value. Uh, IoT is the next solution that allows a business to accomplish their goals. With this, they're able to dig deeper into the manufacturing equipment, into the systems, into the processes, uh, and then support their business goals. Uh, again, IoT is a set of technologies put together in a system which provides more valuable information and supports the business goals. That enables that company to get those additional efficiencies, those, the additional productivity, uh, and to potentially reach the additional competitive differentiation beyond what's available with their current systems, with their current ERP systems, with their current lean uh, efforts, 5S efforts, uh, uh, Six Sigma uh, efforts. IoT can add to those kinds of capabilities uh, and wrap and extend around those existing solutions, pull data from more deeply within the company, uh, provide better data, and to, to reach new levels of reduced expenses, higher revenue, uh, and increased competitive differentiation. So the main idea uh, is that the valuable information from IoT, again, it supports the business goals, the technology for IoT, and the valuable information that comes from IoT supports the business goals. So let's go through a couple ways where uh, we could uh, use IoT to support some of those business goals. Just a couple quick examples. But higher asset utilization uh, is a really interesting one. They want Companies want to manage costs and increase their productivity uh, and also to create new sources of revenue. Um, but the uh, issue is that... Um, Higher asset utilization is uh, a difficult task to to, uh, to to be able to succeed at. Asset utilization, I'll just talk about the definition here real quick. It's effectively a ratio of the total revenue earned for every dollar of assets a company owns. Uh, uh, for a manufacturer, it's a measure of the revenue earned with the assets uh, a company uses to make their products. Uh, and it would then make sense that... Well, to make more revenue, you want to have that machine up and running 
more frequently for longer periods of time. Okay, that's that's fine. But the issue is that manufacturers are, are facing a problem. Their assets uh, are older than they have ever been before. Companies aren't spending as much money as they could or should to buy new equipment. Uh, $65 billion of, uh, dollars of automation systems reaching end of life. Average age of equipment in the U.S. is higher since 1938. Uh, and in fact, I was at a uh, manufacturing company here in the Pittsburgh area just yesterday touring the facility and they talked about the assets that they're using. And this is a leader among leaders of manufacturing companies doing extremely well. They really have their heads in the game. Uh, they have a great focus. But they talked about a lot of the new equipment that's out there that often doesn't make sense to buy. And so they retain some of their old equipment because it's better, higher quality, doesn't try to do too much, isn't overly complicated. And they do end up having to upgrade those systems, upgrade, upgrade the control systems to work with that equipment. However, they're still retaining and using that old equipment. This is happening time and, uh, and again with a lot of companies across the US. Um, but they're able to actually get more productivity out of those systems. And they do that by upgrading the control systems and by pulling more data out of those systems through IoT. Additionally, a lot of manufacturers have limited data on the status of their manufacturing processes uh, Kind of related to the example I'm just talking about. This then causes manufacturers to find out about an issue only after a problem has occurred uh, uh, when you're monitoring the, the condition of, of, of assets. 50% uh, of manufacturers become aware of a problem only after it breaks down. That's, uh, that's It just doesn't work. Uh, that's not a good idea. Fixing equipment only after it fails is a, is a, is a big problem. Because uh, once it has broken down, uh, that equipment has reached uh, an ultimate point of failure. More has more, let's say, just to keep it simple, more pieces of the equipment have broken. Uh, uh, the failure has been more significant, and therefore will take longer to repair. Uh, will uh, keep that machine out of production, and maybe keep the production line down for a longer period of time, lost revenue, higher expenses, and the parts will be more expensive as well. And uh, the the services uh, and costs related to the, to the repairs and replacements and upgrades will take longer. Uh, that is not good. <laughs> Just plain and simple, it's not good. Uh, and this uh, PF diagram uh, can help represent some of that. It, within maintenance or reliability, uh, Using the concepts of maintenance reliability is the primary means of increasing asset utilization for existing equipment. So if you were to maintain a piece of equipment, if you were to repair it before it goes down, and better yet, just like the elevator example, if you were to repair it as soon as you knew about an issue well before it goes down, then you're going to be able to keep that machine up and running longer and prevent lost production time. But this is where the IoT uh, solutions can come into play. Uh, in looking at this curve, you can see uh, that uh, uh, it defines how time and the change in the condition of the equipment between the potential point of failure and the actual functional point of failure uh, will, will will vary. Uh, the, the costs of, of repair will, will vary significantly. Uh, you can see that uh, the earlier the issue is caught you know, at the bottom uh, with the cost to repair, the less expensive it is uh, to, to fix. So with that idea in mind that we want to repair the equipment earlier uh, and we want to get information about the status of that equipment earlier so that we can repair it earlier, let's apply IoT to that situation. So let's say we have some sensors in the machine, uh, either from the manufacturer or we've retrofitted them, what some call uh, slap and stick sensors. Let's pull data from those sensors. Then let's start to apply or to, let's simply watch some of the activity inside the machine. For example, vibrations in a bearing. Uh, an IoT solution will be able to provide data and charts on those vibrations. Uh, and we're gonna keep this really simple. Let's say uh, a local maintenance reliability expert who really knows vibrations of, of motors really well, uh, he can then, or she can then look at those that vibration data, the charts on the screen for the current status uh, and recent history of those vibrations and tell if those vibrations are normal or if they're not. And if they're not, 
uh, he or she would be able to in, uh, uh, understand and then tell somebody, hey, they're not normal, and here's what's probably going on. The bearing is under lubricated. The bearing is over lubricated. The machine or the motor is loose on its mounts. And you ought to send somebody out with a new bearing to replace or a lubricant or a wrench to fix it. At that point, then, uh, you're able to extend the IoT solution. Uh, or let, let me back up a sec, sorry. Let's, at that point, then start to think about extending the IoT sh solution even further. Let's have it start learning about what normal, normal vibrations are. Let's find uh, what abnormal vibrations are, are like. And then at that point, you don't have to have that expert around all the time to be able to tell you some of that basic information. You'll still need that expert for other special situations. But for some common normal vibrations and some common norm, uh, 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 abnormal vibrations, let's use the technology we have at hand allow that expert to be able to util be utilized in higher value situations and then be able to cover more pieces of equipment with an automated system and get indications of issues that are a status of machines where there are issues uh, and get alerts about potential issues uh, and drive action, drive uh, maintenance staff to go out and fix those machines before something expensive happens. That's predictive. This is where you can be watching you know, for issues 24-7, for warnings, send people automatically, uh, even generate uh, work orders and systems automatically to go repair pieces of machinery. And all the while, you are more consistently able to reduce the costs for maintenance for the pieces of equipment, keep the assets running, uh, up and running more often, increase the asset utilization, and thereby drive more revenue as well, reducing costs and driving more revenue. Everybody wins. Can't beat it. Uh, also, there's a uh, uh, interesting uh, example where service departments, if you're a manufacturing company and you're, you manufacture products you put out into the world and your service department needs to maintain them, then you can actually increase your sources of revenue. Um, additional services to provide, higher value services to provide. Uh, and here's a, a quote from somebody who has gone through some uh, uh, IoT solutions, uh, Kevin Bollum, uh, VP of uh, Building Services and Customer, Sarah, uh, Customer Care at Train, the uh, uh, HVAC manufacturing company. Uh, I think they're in, you could call them an OEM. Uh, for every $1 in equipment sales, they have the potential for $12 in sales of services, higher value services, more revenue. Every $1 in equipment sales, they have increased their sales of services significantly. Again, man, you can't beat that. Uh, so we have a basic understanding of what IoT is, and we've seen some examples of why we should consider IoT solutions in a business. But how do we do that? That's a, it's a big question. So the first step is to become data-driven. What does that mean? A data-driven organization is, uh, as I see it, is an organization where every person who can use data to make better decisions and to drive better actions will have access to that data when they need it, having the right data to the right people at the right time. And we're talking from the shop floor to the top floor. That data needs to be available, accurate, and, and timely. Uh, many companies provide the data only to ownership or to management. Uh, but a lot of the companies, you know, a, a lot of companies in general shouldn't forget uh, the operators and maintenance staff because they have a vested interest in keeping the company growing. They want to keep their jobs, if not improve their jobs. They want to get a raise. Uh, so uh, they have a vested interest in the viability of the company. Why not give them the data? Uh, it requires some education, requires some work, some forethought, some planning. But if your company is a leader or becoming a leader amongst followers uh, in what you do, driving towards becoming a data-driven organization is something to, to seriously consider. So where do you start with that? You know, get data and use it. So I, how do we start with becoming a data-driven organization? Let's look at the data uh, and then use it first. You know, the process, connect to the data, uh, visualize the data, then analyze the data, and then optimize it. 
we could talk a little bit about OEE. I mean, there are some calculations uh, that a lot of manufacturing companies use, and one of the really interesting ones is OEE, overall equipment effectiveness. It measures the availability of equipment. Uh, 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 how, I should say it measures how available the equipment is to make money for your company, uh, and it's measured. Or it's uh, displayed as a, as a percentage value. It will measure the availability of the equipment, the performance of the equipment, and the quality of the products that it's producing. Uh, it essentially looks at the uptime versus downtime and all the types of downtime, uh, at least within the, the availability segment of the calculation. And it helps you recognize the various types of downtime. And with that data, then you can focus on improving some of those types of downtime so you can improve the uptime, so you can increase the uptime. The industry best practice with OEE is 85%, uh, but that's really difficult to reach. Uh, many companies think they have uh, an OEE value of anywhere between 60 and 80%, but typically, <laughs> unfortunately, they only have a value of anywhere between 20 and 40%. So when you pull data from, when you connect uh, to and then pull data from the system, uh, from the equipment, and you collect and store that data, you can then visualize it and analyze it. You can go through those that sequence of, of, of steps, connect, collect, uh, visualize, and analyze. Then at that point, you'll be able to figure out and understand what your OEE is, and then you'll be able to actually take action to improve how the business is operating, how the equipment is utilized, how the equipment is maintained. Uh, it's, I mean, I think, from my perspective, looking at OEE is, is is a really good idea for a lot of companies. And again, it's something that a lot of the leaders are doing. So uh, let's move on to some of the key components uh, of an IoT solution. There are several of them. We'll go through each of them briefly. Software, of course, is a big piece. There's some hardware. There's a network to consider. Uh, the interface to external systems because in IoT solutions, you'll pull data from external systems and combine it with machine data, and then there's security. I'm gonna put all of that in perspective. Uh, so let's start with the high-level architecture uh, of an IoT solution. On the left, you have the equipment with the sensors. Let's say they're motors, maybe they're pumps, something so, uh, simple, a subsystem uh, of a larger system. And then you'll have to the right of those, uh, PLCs, the PLCs or the gateway devices will pull data from the sensor, from the motor, pulling that data, that uh, analog to digital data, uh, and then potentially store it there very temporarily, uh, cache the data briefly. Uh, and then depending on the equipment, depending on the connection to the cloud or the on-premise solution, that data will then be pushed by a gateway device up to uh, the IoT software platform. That cloud image here. And that is where you have capabilities uh, such as the data processing, such as the storage, the machine learning, the digital twin. That is the IoT software platform itself. And that is where a lot of the value is in the solution. However, interestingly enough, uh, this is a piece of the solution which a lot of companies think Oh, we, we should create our own software solution, our own IoT software platform. But I'd say no, don't do that. Or I would strongly recommend against doing that unless you're in some extremely, 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 that's three extremely, extremely uh, uh, unusual situation. Um, there are a lot of really great software platforms out there, uh, IoT software platforms out there. We work with a few of them. Uh, and there's no reason to create something that's already out there if it's going to work for you. Uh, also in this solution, uh, in this uh, architecture of an IoT solution, we have external data, the cloud on the bottom, uh, pushing data into that solution. And that external data could be data from your ERP system, data from your CMMS or work order system, data from your PLM, data from a weather service, data from oh, your CRM solution. Who knows what it might be? Um, uh, and then that IoT software platform is where the, uh, again, like I said, where the value is. The value is is in there because that's where it's converting that data, all of the data, external and from the equipment, and converting it into valuable information. 
there it then, uh, at, at that point, going to further to the right is where the data is pushed out via various and sundry devices uh, out to the people who are then going to use that data to drive decisions and to drive actions. Those are the big pieces of it. So you can kind of get a sense. Uh, in the middle is the software. Um, to the uh, left is some of the hardware. Uh, there's external data at the bottom. And then, of course, we should never, ever forget the security. Security uh, wraps around the whole solution. Security is not just in the software platform. Security is not just in the end piece with the users. It's not just uh, in the PLCs or the gateways or within the sensors. It should extend across the whole solution. We'll talk a little bit about software. Uh, there is, uh, uh, again, like I said before, it's the most important part of the IoT solution because it's the piece that unlocks the value, that transforms the data into the valuable information. Within the software piece, there's data. The data, of course, coming from the equipment that's processed and, and analyzed. And then there's the model. I'll talk about this very briefly. The model uh, within an IoT software platform is a, effectively, it's like a virtual definition of the equipment. Uh, it, it's a lot of people call the, the model the, the digital twin. Uh, it contains the information about how the device works algorithms about how the device works and allows you to virtually ask the device questions to get from it information about its past behaviors, its current status, uh, and predictions or, uh, yeah, or predictions for the future. Uh, the model is, is often built using stochastic modeling, uh, which is to say to, to take historical data uh, and to see how it's behaved in the past so that you can then figure out how it's going to behave in the future. A few key points. Uh, I think some of them I've already uh, covered. Uh, this is the core of the IoT solution, this IoT software platform. Uh, and its job is to abstract the physical into the digital. And again, we've kind of already covered that too. It takes that, that data, that physical, that analog data from the sensors, uh, and as it's pushed uh, into the PLCs and gateways and pushed up the backhaul, uh, the connection to the cloud or on-prem solution, it's that at that point, then it's converted into the uh, into digital uh, form and then uh, transformed. Uh, and this IoT software platform is effectively a, a representation of what the equipment does and becomes. Uh, and it, it becomes the the digital value proposition of the device. That model is a really big piece of this this component, this software component, because it again it defines how the the product is working, uh, so that you can investigate, you can query it to understand what's going on. Uh, also, again, there are a lot of systems out there that, that, you know, that call themselves IoT software platforms, uh, uh, and you don't want to reinvent the wheel. But I would suggest, too, with the fact that there are so many of them out there, keep in mind that a lot of them are limited in functionality uh, and are often uh, sometimes proprietary systems. And what I mean by proprietary system is that a company uh, might sell a particular hardware device, and they might then create a, a platform related to that device. And that platform, that IoT software platform, might only work with that one device. You want to be mindful of that, uh, and rather have uh, a a platform that is is more open. Uh, a platform is open to connect to uh, any sensor, to any embedded system, uh, and to any data source. A system that has APIs for other applications to pull data out of it, and it all, that IoT software platform should have a development environment to customize the solution. These are some key things to consider uh, with the IoT software platform. And uh, just a couple other facts that I wanted to, to point out here. With that in mind, I mean, there are hundreds of, of IoT software platforms out there, or so-called software platforms out there, but you know, between you and I, uh, there are probably really only about 10 or 15 real IoT software platforms out there. Uh, the platforms we support uh, are the PTC ThingWorks platform, a company in Boston uh, has, uh, owns and drives, develops this, uh, this platform called ThingWorks. Uh, it's a very strong competitor in the market, which we can get into a little bit later. Uh, we also work with the Microsoft Azure IoT platform and also support the AWS IoT 
uh, platform. Hardware. Let's talk about the hardware. First connected set sensors and actuators and then the embedded systems. The sensors and the actuators are the pieces of the puzzle that capture the data. Uh, it's a trans transducer which is at the heart of the sensor. Uh, and that's where the data is converted uh, uh, or the, the action uh, or energy uh, is converted into uh, DC energy. And then at that point, uh, it's converted from analog to a digital signal. And it, thousands and thousands uh, of points of data are uh, are transmitted from these sensors uh, over uh, over the network. So these sensors are kind of a valuable uh, solution. However, uh, they're kind of a commodity anymore. There are a lot of sensors out there. Costs have gone down significantly. They are becoming really cheap. The trouble at that point is figuring out what is the right sensor for the situation. Uh, a couple things to consider regarding sensors are uh, the accuracy, repeatability, uh, range, uh, the noise, and the resolution uh, for the sensors. Within embedded systems, uh, uh, let's let's talk about uh, the fact that all sensors require some kind of embedded system or a chipset with power uh, and the ability to transmit the data over some some kind of radio signal. Uh, uh, some of the the uh, and this is where the embedded system comes into place. It has those capabilities. Uh, some embedded systems have more powerful logic, including you know, full operating systems like uh, reduced uh, editions of uh, the Windows uh, system or of Linux. Uh, they can also process data, filter data, and analyze data locally before that data is then sent up to the cloud. They can take in data, cache the data, uh, reduce the amount of data, uh, actually run some some pretty significant calculations if needed, uh, and maybe even do some basic predictive uh, uh, work there, and then send less data over the wire to keep communications less expensive, uh, uh, and and to allow you to store less data uh, over the wire, so to speak. Uh, the purpose of the hardware generally is is to capture the data, to process the data locally, like I just talked about, and to secure the data. This is an important piece. Security starts here, starts at the sensor, starts at the embedded system. Uh, and then that data, the, the uh, sensors, actu actuators, and uh, embedded systems are then used to transmit the data. Network, a lot of pieces to the network. Uh, the OT network uh, or the uh, operational technology network connects the sensors to the network. Uh, the IT network connects the OT network to the backhaul. Backhaul is the piece uh, that goes up to the cloud. It takes the data from the uh, from the local network or the internet uh, up to the um, to the internet and to the public cloud. Uh, the IoT cloud piece uh, is the cloud computing aspect of it. Uh, it's the uh, the AWS, the Azure, the data centers, uh, et cetera, that are up there that will have the very foundational pieces uh, of, uh, of the IoT software platforms for storage, the API, uh, uh, and some basic processing. And then on top of that, you have the IoT platforms, the software packages that manage the devices and run the application code uh, and that contain uh, some of the other pieces we've talked about before, uh, including the model uh, uh, and the data, and also provides the development environment, which manages the digital twin and the application code. It's a lot of components to, to the network. Uh, a few key thoughts uh, are that the edge devices are the gateways, and the routers and switches are, are you could consider those part of the network fabric, uh, which have increasing computing and storage capabilities in the network. Uh, so the, the networks, so to speak, are getting stronger, are getting better, getting faster, getting smarter, uh, actually, with the edge devices and, and gateways with their increasing capabilities. Uh, one of the interesting uh, uh, things to think about for the operational technology, the OT network, uh, are the types of radios used or radio signals used, uh, uh, LPLN, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, the cellular, uh, LPWA, LOPAN, uh, all of those, uh, these are all communication protocols at the network level within the operational technology. The 
systems, there's, that is actually sometimes uh, one of the things that trip up some projects. Uh, what are, uh, what's the best way to uh, transmit the data? What's the best technology to use? Uh, there is an example I remember hearing about the BNSF uh, railroad company uh, having created a solution over a cell network and they found that that whole solution became unbelievably expensive for the cell charges. They then ended up coming up with another solution, which I think was low pan, but I don't maybe it was LPWA. I, I don't remember what it was, uh, but it was a much better, uh, much more solid solution. And part of the solution was to have the edge devices do more of the work and to send less data. Then you didn't need such a strong network. Could still get a lot of value out of that pre-processed, limited, filtered, aggregated data uh, sent up to uh, through over the backhaul to the cloud solution, uh, and the IoT solution still ended up being incredibly valuable for the company. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, business case. Also, within the operational uh, uh, technology layer in the OT network, you have various protocols uh, for the data, BACnet, OPC UA, MT Connect, uh, CAN bus, so all these different protocols. This is how the data is packaged and communicated from one device to another. This is also another tripping point for projects. You need to, need to be able to have software capabilities to be able to take the data from the various pieces of equipment and sensors uh, and devices and PLCs and be able to translate that data uh, to a form that can then be used by the IoT software platform to then, of course, convert it to valuable information. And that's where um, products like uh, the Connectware uh, connectivity piece within the PTC ThingWorks platform really helps. You can use those solutions to be able to translate the data uh, uh, and make it uh, usable, uh, effectively, just to make the data usable by the IoT software platform. Uh, the interface to external systems is also something uh, to think about very briefly. There are a few systems which I'll mention here briefly, the external systems to interface with. One would be analytics, you know, the BI, business intelligence, and machine learning or AI systems. Uh, data services like weather, maps, pricing, traffic, inventory, uh, maps uh, that would be important for monitoring vehicles or for asset tracking or for monitoring uh, uh, machinery in the farm, let's say, as it moves around a crop. Um, uh, there are also business systems uh, to to take into consideration, ERP systems, CRM, financial, PLM, uh, and there are a lot of other IoT products, IoT other IoT solutions which might feed into your IoT solution. Those are all quick examples of external solutions which can feed data into your IoT solution, add more valuable information, to your solution and then be able to uh, uh, augment the value, the, the data you have to be able to then provide value to your, your end users. Most of the connections to the external system or into the, well, um, either way really, uh, from the IoT software platform out to those external systems or vice versa, it's usually done through APIs, application programming interfaces, which are a common way for uh, software developers to connect systems together. Uh, one of the other things to, to consider here, too, is the analytics piece. The analytics piece is a really important piece because this is one of those critical subsystems, if you will, within this whole IoT software platform where the data is transformed into the valuable information. And there are three basic uh, types of uh, analytics that are, are very often used. You can start off with uh, the descriptive and diagnostic analysis uh, to look at past data. That's, this is a business intelligence. You're providing uh, data on current conditions and status, maybe some basic history, some calculated values. Uh, that data is then summed and averaged or aggregated uh, and effectively provides basic uh, uh, descriptive statistics. There are also rules engines for looking at current streaming data, data in motion. Uh, um, uh, and then there's also uh, predictive uh, uh, analytics or predictive systems. This, these systems will allow you to look into the future and this requires AI or a subset of AI called machine learning, uh, which effectively uses large sets of data to get predictions of events, you know, such as machine failures, uh, uh, 
one of the issues you have to make sure of is that you have a sufficient volume of data, uh, uh, and that data must be clean and consistent. Um, uh, the system uh, can then, at that point, learn from the from the data, uh, and then be able to predict whatever issues you're defining the the the, the learning model to to be able to predict. Quickly moving on to uh, security, uh, this is where uh, you are, of course, protect, uh, protecting all of the, the, the data uh, and all of the related systems. Uh, and we have to keep in mind here protecting uh, data at rest, data that's stored at any point throughout the system that it's stored, whether it's stored in the edge devices or gateway devices where it's cached or where it's stored within the uh, IoT software platform. Uh, also, there are a lot of attack vectors to uh, consider too. Uh, the physical network, cloud, web, application, mobile, uh, and the, 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 the system as well. There's a lot of attack vectors to, to take care of, and uh, we would need about two days, if, if not more, to talk about all the aspects of security, and it'd be too much to cover here, but uh, I think one of the points that I made earlier is probably uh, important to make to, to repeat here, which is that the security needs to be considered from the very beginning of the process, from the sensors, all the way through the embedded systems, up the backhaul, uh, through the, o, uh, the OT, the operational techno technical, uh, technology uh, network up the backhaul into the cloud uh, solution uh, or the IoT software platform storage etc uh, uh, and then out to the end user you need to protect uh, the data in uh, all of those places and that's of course where all of these attack, uh, attack vectors come in and when you're looking at implementing a solution you really ought to have somebody who's a security expert within the context of IoT uh, to make sure that all of those vectors are, are, are addressed. Here's one of the interesting topics. It's been kind of an interesting topic for us in talking with clients over time. How do you tackle a project? How do the projects work? Well, you have to start from the top down. You really ought to start with the business goals. What's the value of this IoT solution? look at the value of it, uh, and then start to think about the tech and the data eventually. What is the value of the product? Why will this be valuable? How How is the information uh, going to be used? Where are you going to realize that value? You need to answer those kinds of questions first. Uh, 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 once you can figure out what the, the business goals are, what this IoT solution is going to do, then at that point, you can figure out what kind of information you need to enable those business goals. Once you then have determined what information you need, then you can look at what data to capture, which will then be transformed into, of course, the valuable information to create that value. Once you have the data figured out, then you can get down to the bottom level uh, and then finally figure out the technology to use to gather and transform the data. Uh, which will then, of course, create the, the value for the IoT uh, solution. Uh, and that that technology includes the, the sensors to collect the data, the cloud platforms uh, to use or storage platforms, uh, the IoT software platforms, et cetera. Uh, I don't know if I can stress this enough, but notice that I had said pick the, the IoT software platform last and start with the business goals, start with the value. What is the end value you have in mind? If you don't go through that process, you will very easily, especially uh, for groups of engineers, we've, we've seen this happen, uh, where groups of engineers will start to uh, go down uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland rabbit holes and sometimes maybe never even come out uh, if somebody else hadn't grabbed them and pulled them out because they start to go in circles uh, trying to figure out what data to grab and what technology to use to grab it, uh, what sensors to use, when they haven't even figured out what they're trying to achieve yet. The CEO of the company has said, go forth and IOTize. <laughs> and uh, you really need to, to have some guidance uh, with what you're going to be doing with that IoT solution first before you start to figure out the details. So that's why I suggest starting from the, the top. Uh, 
I think in line with that too, at a higher level, let's talk about uh, how I IoT projects will work. There's a certain process that you should go through, again, starting from the top down. Uh, again, review the business goals, where the business is going, what's currently uh, going on within the business, and why are you even considering IoT at all. And then at that point, pick a problem to solve, and then define the business case. Defining the business case, let's say you know it might be asset monitoring to improve the asset utilization, you know, drive some more revenue, or maybe uh, even more basic, our machines are breaking down too often. We know that they can be better. Let's increase the asset utilization. Let's set up some remote monitoring. Let's monitor those assets. Uh, so uh, at that point, the defining the business case is to then it means understanding the the cost of the current problem. How is that current problem holding the business back? It would be a good idea at that point to have a basic theory or a hypothesis about if you were able to do this, if you were able to get this certain data, then I would be able to solve this problem. Have that basic theory or, or hypothesis defined. And then if you can, try to define a KPI, key performance uh, indicator or metric uh, to track to make sure that you have, you're ultimately going to reach success. Uh, once you have that business case with the hypothesis and with the KPI uh, and with the data defined to inform that business case, at that point then you can start to put together a proof of concept. Uh, let's plan the proof of concept first though. Once you are creating, while you are creating that plan, uh, you need to uh, make sure that you have all of the right people in line to, to work on the on the project, people with the right levels of expertise within software development, data uh, science, mechatronics, uh, uh, the solutions architect, UI, UX people, uh, and anybody else, uh, IT department, can't forget the IT department, they must be involved as well. Once you put that team together, uh, and the team uh, that has the expertise, and that team can be external and internal to the company, uh, and you've put together the, the plan for the proof of concept, then at that point, you uh, execute the project. But only once you have that plan, I would suggest executing that project. And also, here's another kind of limiter. Execute only that proof of concept. Don't try to tackle too much. Let's keep that proof of concept simple. Let's try to prove that hypothesis. Let's try to make that the needle move on that KPI. Uh, proofs of concept are not big and complicated. They really shouldn't be. Uh, uh, and the, also, they are not the end solution. It's simply, it's a really small way uh, or a very simple project to prove that you can move the needle, that you can pull a little bit of data and analyze it a little bit and then determine at a basic level that you've proven the, the, the use case. But once you've completed that proof of concept and once you've proven the hypothesis, then at that point, you can move on into the uh, to the rest of the IoT journey. But I, Keep in mind, don't stop at that proof of concept. Even if you go sideways, if even if it doesn't work, come up with another hypothesis. Try another proof of concept. At that point, then uh, hopefully you'll have been able to prove the business case. The reason why I suggest very strongly not to stop at the proof of concept uh, is because so many companies, typically 70%, in fact, are unable to move on beyond the proof of concept due to poor planning, lack of corporate leadership, uh, lack of experience to steer clear of the hurdles, uh, the experience in IoT, um, budget, et cetera. Uh, uh, so if you can move beyond the POC, uh, the, the proof of concept, then at that point, you can keep moving on to the, the MVP, the minimally viable product, the, the pilot, and then eventually get into, into production. There are a number of do's and don'ts uh, about IoT projects that I'll go over briefly here. Uh, within business context, make sure that you're focusing on IoT, uh, where IoT can help the business. Uh, here's another really interesting one. You can kind of get it from some of the words I was using, proof of concept, uh, MVP. Uh, operate the, the, the project like a lean startup. Keep it simple, work iteratively. Uh, this is a new arena for everybody. And it gets really complex because there are a lot of different people, a lot of different departments involved. 
So operate it like a lean startup, like a small group, a local, under one person as a, a leadership and a, uh, under one corporate sponsor who has uh, the right sway within the organization to, to move it forward. Uh, and also keep in mind on the business end, the company that is getting into IoT really needs to already be a data-driven organization. And if they aren't, they should be moving towards that before they even think about becoming an IoT uh, a solutions company or before they start to implement IoT solutions. From the technology uh, standpoint, again, repeating some ideas here, definitely use an IoT software platform that is off the shelf. Don't build a custom IoT software platform. There are a lot of them out there and uh, a lot of them very likely will mat match or meet uh, most if not all of your needs. And also make sure that you're aware of the technology behind IoT. Uh, again, also remembering start at the top, you know, business values and then all the way down and uh, the, the data and the sensors and the IoT software platform should be one of the last selections you make. And when doing that, make sure that you have defined already the types of technologies that you're willing to accept on the back end uh, so that you can make sure that your internal teams or external teams can support that technology. From a project experience, again, some of the things that I've mentioned before as a good summary, uh, make sure you have people on the team with IoT experience so that they can steer clear of the hurdles. Uh, don't start the project, uh, again, uh, don't start the project by defining the data sensors. Uh, start by defining the business outcomes. What are the business goals you want to reach? What are the requirements? And then you can go down from there towards the technology. Uh, another good phrase uh, is think big but start, start small. I like that one a lot uh, because, you know, as I've said here on this slide, that's the only way you're going to get something out the door. Think big but start small. Uh, and also don't forget the major steps in an IoT project. With uh, all of that said, uh, some of the products that we support uh, as a company, Ectobox, uh, include the PTC ThingWorks software plat IoT software platform uh, and the I Microsoft Azure IoT software platform, and we're getting into the AWS platform as well. Uh, lastly, we are uh, IoT certified professionals. Uh, our process to work with companies uh, is to start off with some basic free conversations, free cons consultations with some recommendations, and at that point, uh, if there's something there, if there's a good reason for your company to get into an IoT solution, and that's one of the first things we're talking about, you know, if, if there's no good reason, then, you know, no reason, uh, if there's no good reason to get into an IoT project, then there's no reason for us to be able to work together in that circumstance. So that's some of the stuff that we start to determine at a high level and that those consultations. Uh, at that point, then we get into doing an assessment and visioning project. And that's where we dig even deeper. Are we sure that it makes sense to get into an IoT project? Let's define that specific problem to start with that hypothesis. Let's build the business case. Let's do the planning for the proof of concept. And then our next step is to move into the proof of concept and prove that business case. And then we're very happy to continue down the, the, the journey to help enable the company to generate the new sources of revenue and uh, save those uh, additional expenses or reduce the expenses. Um, uh, and and make the the big difference in their competitive advantage. With that said, uh, feel free to call or email anytime uh, if you want to learn more about you know, whether you should start an IoT project, uh, how one can start an IoT project, how to fix an existing IoT project. We've done that before as well, uh, and even just a simple question of when. Uh, happy to have those conversations. With that, uh, I've left only a couple minutes, unfortunately, for uh, some questions, but let's uh, let's see what we have. Thanks, Kevin. Um, that was a lot of useful information. Um, like you said, we only have a couple minutes, so I'm going to um, have to just select one or two questions. Um, let's see. Can you give an example of a very small project to start with? Yeah, there's one that we're uh, formulating now with a company here in the Pittsburgh area uh, where they have some CNC machines uh, in their uh, manufacturing unit, and they're trying to determine whether those, uh, whether the, the issues they, they think exist within production are caused by the CNC machine uh, uh, itself, downtime due to the machine, or downtime due to the operator not available because they're off doing something else. Uh, or if there are issues with 
uh, uh, parts not being available, etc. So what we're doing is looking at creating a small proof of concept to, to understand the reasons for downtime. That's it, to understand the reasons for downtime. And so we will work with them to gather that downtime data from the pieces of equipment uh, and then uh, from that equipment uh, be able to display one or two basic charts uh, to the end users and then from there be able to uh, uh, prove the business case for uh, why they think there is downtime and, and then go from there. So that would be a, a good example of a, a proof of concept. Great, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. We have a few more questions, but because we don't have time to answer them today, we will be following up with you via email because um, we want to make sure that you aren't left with any unanswered questions. And uh, that seems to be about it for today. Um, Ectobox would like to thank you for attending this free education session. We hope you enjoyed it and feel that you've come away from this experience with a better understanding of how IoT can improve your business. If you have any further questions, you think of any uh, along the way, or have any feedback, we invite you to reach out to Kevin. Oh, never mind. They're all gone. <laughs> yep. It's all good. Okay. Cool. cool. Yeah, I was just looking at that, too. I'm like, wait, there's two people. Oh, that's us. Yeah. Yeah, they're gone. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, I'll call you directly rather than okay. through the system. Okay.